I'm here too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's me and Dana. Just so you know. Hi, Dana. Hey. Hey. 66 days Jennifer has been in jail. Wow. Four times the uh, Canadian Border Security Agency has driven her to the border and dumped her on the highway without uh, anything else but the gardening clothes she was wearing when she was picked up. No money. And the cell has described that activity as tantamount to attempted murder. You don't put a woman in the middle of the night on a highway and say you're on your own with no money right. and no clothes without it being a an attempt at disposing of that person. And yep. today is day 66. And attempting to get a lawyer um, has proven so far um, that we are unable to get through legal aid a lawyer period, although three people have shown up at the court at different times saying they were the lawyers from legal aid and they were trying to talk Jennifer into leaving Canada, not defending her right to be here. What we have is a crime committed by a couple of 25-year-old border guards, females, who are jealous of Jennifer for whatever reason and would not allow her into the country or even to call her husband so that they could be given an explanation that her entry would only be temporary while she dropped off the stuff she had carried from California and would move on to Ogdensburg to complete the paperwork. None of that was allowed, and she ended up with a two-and-a-half-year stay in Ogdensburg with no, no right to cross. And then when the minister was changed... Uh, they allowed weekend visits, which she honored uh, until uh, 2014, 2013, uh, in the middle of January, when she was evicted from her uh, apartment, which she had been described by the landlord's husband as the best tenant we ever had uh, on, on uh, uh, what appears to be the uh, pressure applied upon the landlord by his wife whose uh, relationship to the gray nuns who run all of Ogdensburg and connected to uh, uh, nunneries all across the U.S. and California. They, uh, they were uh, applying the kind of pressure to put Jennifer out on the street. That was followed up by uh, social services who would not provide a residence and on the coldest day of the year, she was told she had to travel some 50, 70 miles to Messina to find a room which would be paid for in a motel for three days. And during that period, she had to find a residence or they would cut it off, but they were not prepared to pay 
for the room, even though for two and a half years they kept a woman who had been earning $100,000 a year as a director of nursing in California. They would not allow her to be hired by any uh, place in Ogdensburg, not even drugstores. So the co full control by the Grey Nuns uh, on that side, full control by young women at CBSA on this side, decided for us and I'm uh, 73 years old now, and Jennifer is 60 years old, that we were not allowed to live together because they have an unspoken need to keep us apart. And today is day 66, and they're threatening to send her to a mental institution because she wants to be with her husband. And of course, if you were uh, some of those people, you'd know why they would want to get rid of their spouse because their spouse wouldn't put up with the kind of shit they impose on us. Jennifer is to appear in court again on Thursday. And what was supposed to be a hearing to decide on a trial, although they turned down the moving of the trial away from the Seaway sea control of CBSA, to Ottawa, or even to Kentville, which is part of their own territory. Uh, they've turned that down. Uh, and now the talk is they're going to change, instead of a trial, is to try to get her locked up in a mental institution. This is a woman who, for years, took over as director of nursing, in a 99-bed, locked-down, long-term institution for patients with Alzheimer's. Now, you try to imagine the kind of empathy that a person has to have to live and direct a place where you have 99 Alzheimer patients and come out of that period in time when she resigned in uh, the end of June 2010 at a salary of around $100,000 a year, come out of that having risen the um, qualification of her um, residence from a four-star to five-star, and it immediately lost the five-star rating the year after her departure. Canada, on the other hand, was announcing at the time through the Minister of Health that what was required in Canada was someone with exactly her qualifications. Yet, 24-year-old girls at the border decided that she should not be allowed to come into the country. And a male border guard yelled out to her, we don't want people like you in Canada. Now, what did he mean by people like you when the Minister of Health just finished saying that's exactly people like her they wanted in Canada? 
And when Jennifer told the border security that all of their activities were being recorded and communicated to the government of Canada's highest level, their answer was, we, CBSA, are the government of Canada. How do you like them apples? Sour. Who do they work for? Who pays them? Since the three people who showed up claiming to be sent to be her lawyer were never hired by anyone at legal aid, who's paying them to do what they're doing? And what is the reasoning behind their fears. We don't know. Two people showed up at the prison last Tuesday and were brought to the professional meeting room where prisoners normally meet their lawyers, and they told Jennifer if she gave them permission to come here to the farm and collect her clothes, they would take her to the airport and ship her to California. She said, I don't want to go to California. I want to be with my husband. Every time you throw me out, I return. And that's what I intend to do, is return until somebody with a functioning brain among you decides to leave me alone. Now there's a different problem that has arisen for these people. The government that has ruled Canada for the last 10 years has been under a man by the name of Stephen Harper, Progressive Conservative Party of Canada. Nothing progressive, nothing conservative about any actions taken. But on Monday night, they were all kicked out of office, and a new party an old party called the Liberals, which you don't have in the U.S. We have New Democrats for Democratic Party. We have Progressive Conservatives for Republicans. But in the middle is the Liberal Party. It kind of sometimes leans right, sometimes leans left. Well, it won a majority government and will be the government of Canada for the next four and a half years. And they have given uh, all of the uh, office staff and members of parliament 18 days, everybody who lost the election, get out of town, pack up your bags and leave, make room for the new team coming in. And in the bureaucracy of Canada, the minister is responsible from a political position to speak for the bureaucracy of his department or her department to the people of Canada through the parliament buildings. But the actual person that runs the department is known as a deputy minister, and he's like the CEO of the department. Never do I recall in my 73 years that system changing, because what always happened is the deputy minister is the spokesperson for the department and therefore provides continuity. And that continuity, when they change departments, is usually done midterm 
so that it doesn't interfere with the continuity of the political party in in power at the time. This time, all the deputy ministers have been told they're being reviewed and be prepared to resign and leave the government if the government so chooses. So what you have here is deputy ministers who are normally nominated by the Privy Council of Canada, which is not of Canada, but really of MI6, military intelligence in England, same people who control David Icke, they normally give a name as a recommendation and the government puts the person in power. What has changed now is the question. Why do the bosses of these deputy ministers want to throw them all out? And I put to you that for the same reasons as the people who are paying the border guards, either through uh, tip, a promotion, a, an increase in salary, or a bigger pension, those people who control the border guards and 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 really manage them rather than the government of Canada have decided that border guards uh, and bureaucrats, generally speaking, are too powerful for what is required in the way of change in the coming years. Everything to date uh, in government has been uh, linked to how you manage the piece of real estate that is within your boundaries. That requires hardworking men and women, both in urban and rural situations. What they now know and understand is the future is not on Earth. The future is in space. And the people who have been raised and trained to live on Earth are inappropriate to working in space. A lot of it has to do with transportation and distance between places. As you know, we've talked about in the past about Voyager 1 and 2 sent out by the U.S. in 1976, I believe, uh, took until 2011 to get outside the solar system. Or, in other words, you have basically a 30-some year period of time where the person must be a sleeper, a sleeper cell, waiting for its opportunity to disembark on some piece of rock out in the Earth cloud and returning uh, by imagery, communications, the uh, things they find to decide whether or not that particular rock should be explored further or left behind. Since this is not a return journey, if they uh, are not required to uh, uh, see to a development of the rock, they simply are left on the rock to, to die in, in their singularity, if you will, as a, 
uh, sole individual who's been there. There are billions of these rocks to visit, and therefore it is inappropriate to do what was done in the past by the pilgrims of moving a whole village type of community uh, at one time and establish a colony. So over the history of humanity on the planet since the Ice Age, human beings have been genetically engineered to suit a particular purpose of development which changed over time, leading up to this time where now it's in space. So we've had uh, troglodytes living in caves. We've had uh, hunter foragers for a while. We've had an agricultural society for a while, a, an industrial society for a while, a technological society for a while. And unbeknownst to most people, uh, the human beings being born on the planet were being genetically modified for that purpose by what is known as the factory for making foundlings. Foundlings are supposedly people, young babies, who have been abandoned and picked up by nuns and adopted into existing families uh, for their own security. However, the truth be known that most of these babies were never delivered to the nunneries. They were, in fact, made there. In, inside the secret society aspects of all nunneries, making babies to be known as foundlings would in fact be the way you build a new batch of human beings. Since that baby, once in, grown up and married, would then pass on its genetics to its children, who would then pass it on to their children, who pass it on for four generations. And I'll give you one example is in Ontario in Canada, we uh, have families that had average two and a half to three and a half children per family. In the na neighboring French province of Quebec, and a smaller way on the other side in Manitoba, uh, families grew to be 16, 18, 20 kids. And nobody would speak about why and how that could happen. And yet it was by um, a family that may have two or three kids of their own taking in and being paid by the government or the nuns a fee to raise these children as members of their family. So although they may have two kids of their own, they might have 16 kids who are foundlings and they were used for distribution into the northern United States and eastern Canada. And as they move along from, say, Quebec out to Ogdensburg, New York, the babies that they would make uh, from eggs taken out of females who were sent to them uh, as uh, wardens of prisons, which was the task of northern New York for a long time, underground caves, 
um, and and buildings built to house young girls, eggs were taken from them. And uh, in the caves underneath were the prisoners. And semen taken from the prisoners that matched the kind of crime they were there for, serial rapists, murderers, you name them, were inserted into the eggs and turned into foundlings. This entire project began at the time in England in the 1500s of Henry VIII. I'm talking about this project for use in North America, not the project of genetic engineering. That's been going on since uh, the Ice Age uh, and 16,000 years before the Ice Age, it was going on in the pre-Ice Age period from at least 80,000 B.C. But in... Uh, in the time of Henry VIII, and Henry, of course, is the word for chicken making eggs, hen, are Y. A Y is a two becoming one, male, female becoming one, or one becoming male and female, depending on which direction you want to go. Human beings began on the planet as one uh, in androgynous women, and eventually the process was changed to make two so that the male could handle the heavier tasks and the female continue the management of the families or clans during that period. But the first signs of the arrival in Canada in the 1500s uh, was on an island uh, at the east end of Canada. The island's name is Newfoundland. Foundlings found land. And they control a part on the mainland next to Quebec, which is called Labrador. Laboratory. 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 Labrador. The place from which the babies come. Out of the labs in Labrador to Newfoundland, French-speaking mostly because Great Britain was controlled by France for a long period of time. Scottish people always learn two languages in Scotland, one being French, and it was all controlled by priesthoods. But the priesthood being the visible person collecting money and all of that was handing over the money to the nuns who dress like Arabs with long robes down to the ground so you can't tell they're pregnant. And that lasted until 1976 or so. Before the gray nuns in Ogdensburg it lasted till 1955, where they had a going out of business sale of babies, over 200 babies, of which we believe Jennifer was one of those babies. We also believe what it says in the New York Times, dating back to the 1800s, that Ogdensburg was part of Canada because they talked in there about a, a fire happened last night in Ogdensburg, Canada. So some kind of arrangement was made to transfer parts of Canada to the U.S. under a treaty signed 
at World War II by the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Canada. And it's linked to the defense of the North American continent uh, in Colorado, NORAD, and called the Ogdensburg Agreement. But we believe, since Jennifer was born in 1955, that she was one of the babies distributed out of the Grey Nuns household. All basically Canadians who had moved to Ogdensburg, most of them from the province of Quebec, but all could speak English and traveled to Boston by plane now and to Ottawa by a direct highway called the 416, which adds up to 11, by the way, for 2011 was the date they had planned as the turnaround date between working on the planet or working in space. Jennifer had to spend two and a half years there, got to be turned down at every turn where the nuns control. And by the way, if Protestants think that the nuns only run Catholic places, they should go to Ogdensburg because the people who run the Protestant hospitals, uh, the director, last director, was basically just a transfer from the Catholic hospital to the Protestant hospital. So uh, the nuns run everything. Nobody pays attention to nuns. They are the least likely suspect. Yet they are the force behind the visible controllers. They are the ones who, for uh, a period of time since Mary Magdalene and the Virgin Mary have controlled genetic engineering in the Christian world. Today, much of that is done in Africa. It used to be done in the Middle East. It was done for a while in Latvia. Syria and Israel have similar lettering based upon the name of the first genetically engineered baby mentioned in the Bible. Abraham's wife's name was Sarai, S-A-R-I. Syria has Sarai in it. Israel has Sarai in it, which basically tells you what's going on right now. Two, three million Syrians are refugees. They are looking for a place to become bureaucrats. Border guards is their specialty. They have the big Y in their name. Abraham was 100 years old when his own family son was born to replace the one that he had formerly made with a slave. His wife was 90. How do you make a baby 
with a female mother at the age of 90. What you get is the same story as the Virgin Mary. You are handed a child by an archangel. An ark, in that case, is Noah's ark. After the destruction of the existing gene pool, 1,100 years after Adam and Eve's story, Noah built an ark. An ark that could not in any way imaginable carry two animals of every kind in the world on board, but could very easily carry all the genetic material to make any of the animals on board and replace them, including humans, at the end of their 40-day journey, which in space means 40 years. Born on Earth, you spend six years being um, educated, if you want to call kindergarten an education and such, and then you're locked in a capsule, very much like an acorn off an oak tree from alpha to omega the beginning to the end you are shipped out one at a time 34 years sleep time and six years on earth means that when you arrive on your piece of rock your life begins at 40 That is what's going on, and that is what is keeping creation from doing what it wants and needs to do on this farm, and why it chose Jennifer to be my wife, and that way we could d divide the effort in two. The Royal Bank of Canada has a log logo on the front of its buildings. It tells the world how troglodytes began. It's got the picture of the world, a globe, and between its paws, a mountain lion holds the world and underneath it says RBC purportedly Royal Bank of Canada however that's not how it worked troglodyte means cave dweller how did humans become cave dwellers when there were none at the beginning. The main animal that was created to live in a cave was a rat. And a rat has one purpose in life, and that's to go every place it can go. And in a cave, that's what it did is go every place it could go. And that meant squeezing through tiny, tiny spaces to go from one big room to another if need be. That later on in time could be traced by people who would expand the hole and allow travel between two separate places such as you have in the pyramid with the queen and the king's chamber. But the rat is the one who developed the 
the uh, exploration team that toured the cave. And the rat was stopped dead in its tracks when it came to some places where there was a gap in continuity created either by a big hole or by a river or water too wide for it to jump across. So evolution done by creation added wings to the rat and turned it into a bat. R, B, C. So a bat basically filled in the holes that the rat couldn't do on its own. It went up to the ceiling, flew over rivers, and came down on the other side. And between the two of them, then they got to examine everything. And then the third situation came up. When we leave the cave, we need to be something different. We need to be bigger. We need to be stronger. We need to grow into different sizes based on the task that will be discovered once you're out. So the cat is an extension of the rat with some of the qualities of a bat. It can climb trees. It can jump. There have been other animals who've become specialized in that, like squirrels and chipmunks and other animals, but the original is the cat. And the cat was big enough and strong enough to breed and gave birth to four, five, six kittens at a time. It's got room at the table when it comes to teats to feed an entire family. But sometimes the mother died, and the children died, babies died as well. In reverse, sometimes the cat lived and enlarged itself to become a lion, a tiger a mountain lion, panther, jaguar, has about six or eight names. And there's one thing that I've told you before about cats. If a mother loses her babies, she still feels the need to pass on the milk that she's making and it's pressure that's hard for her to control so she goes out on a trip to see if she can find lost babies and if not lost babies somebody else's baby and being a place designed to raise cats here, we see it happen all the time with a female carrying a kitten in her jaw by the neck and taking that kitten home. Well, in the world of human beings, the system is not much different. The original birth of anything, before there were any rats, cats, bats or cats or lions, before there were any of those, or before there were any human beings, 
what existed on the planet was elements, a table of a recipe for making things. And those elements are found in different places. But by the stroke of quote unquote luck, at one time or other, millions of years apart, millions of miles from each other, elements come together. And elements create life by the very nature of coming together in the proper proportions in a solution we call amniotic fluid, but brine basically is found in different lakes like Lake Van where Noah's Ark was supposed to come to rest. And those two things coming together, the amniotic fluid or brine, water, and the elements of the right proportion If perchance are lucky enough to be struck by lightning, it gives that combination a charge that brings on life, depending on which elements are there. You will get plants, you will get um, bugs, you will get animals, including human species, all dependent upon the elements coming together, finding their location to be within a proper solution or amniotic fluid and a spark. Same way as if somebody has a heart attack and their heart stops, they take the electric gadgets and stick them on each side and zap them, and the electric charge restores the heartbeat. Similar activity. Only one problem, that one person born that day has no nurturer and is doomed to die because once it's born it needs to be fed and since there are no other human beings around how can it be fed well the Royal Bank tells you by its symbolism that a mountain lion coming by seeing a little baby just born doesn't give a damn whether it's a cat or a human being. Picks it up, takes it to its cave and feeds it. Probably most of them die, but some survive. And over billions of years that we've been on this planet, about 14 billion people have been born. That's about 7 billion before the Ice Age. including the period after the Ice Age to the present who have lived and died. 
$7 billion. Another $7 billion today walks on the planet and are alive. And one of the reasons there are seven billion today and not um, one billion or five hundred million is because along the way nuns learned the process of genetic engineering. In those days they would have been known as Amazon. because most of them ended up living in the bre the uh, jungles of Brazil. But the ones that started the process were in fact in what is today the Black Sea. Clan mothers from North Africa meeting uh, the um, what's their name again? The uh, males from from the mountains. Oh, Neanderthals. Neanderthals. You got it. Thank you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. And together they learned how to make babies by copulation, which took over as the means of which babies are mostly made today, but did not prevent the making of babies by uh, hermaphrodite or genetic engineering. Hermaphrodites would make clones of themselves, while genetic engineering can make whatever they want in the way of personality or traits or size, giants or pygmies of any color, mulatto all the way to black. All of that is possible when you understand the gene pool um, supply that is hinted at by Noah's Ark. Everything written in the Bible and in the Old Testament of the Hebrews comes from before Noah in the books of Enoch, which were written at about year 600, starting with Adam, 4000 B.C., 3400 Enoch and his son Methuselah. Methuselah was said to have lived 963 years or something where in fact what they were saying and it's hidden in the language of coding is that from each human being, you can take genetic material and reproduce the person that existed before a number of times until you run out of genetic material. But once you've discovered the existence of stem cells, Stem cells allow you to multiply the number of people you can make without end because you're just manufacturing copies of stem cells. For you guys in New York, it's important for you to know that the World Series will be played in New York against Kansas City by the New York stem cells. Mm -hmm. They wrote the word backwards and call it METS. The interesting thing is that they are going to play against 
a team from western the western side of the Missouri River uh, the Royals Kansas City Royals K C R remote control is the mission so Kansas City Royals here represent the Ark of the Covenant, a gadget that looks like a box and has two uh, spheres or something sticking out of each side, positive and negative, and it is used to charge up living stones. What is a living stone? Jonathan Livingstone Seagull. A living stone started off as two piles of sand of different material that got crushed together under pressure and ended up having one of the sands turn into a stone like quartz and the other part of the stone, the outside one, turning into something like granite. And they live happily ever after because what they are basically are the basis of a magnet. And what happens is that when a charge by lightning hits the ground, that charge of electricity follows a path of water until it hits living stones, and then it recharges or charges the living stones with electricity called magnetism and moves along the trail of these stones. If you happen to stand over a place that has living stones underground and are charged by your local hydro company, you will find that if you put thermometers out in different places, as I did in front of our house and garage, you will find a very different reading on thermometers that are just feet apart. I've had some thermometers, uh, I'm going to try to put this in uh, American uh, numbers here, Fahrenheit. If, if you have one thermometer at 50 degrees and 10 feet away you have another one at 52 degrees and 10 feet away you have another one at 51 degrees, you're basically dealing with the margin. However, if at 20 degrees you have at, at at 20 feet away you have a thermometer that reads 140 degrees and you know it's not 140 degrees because you wouldn't be there but that's what the thermometer says so you say oh there must be a defective thermometer so you go switch them around. The one that was at 140 drops to 52. The one that was at 52 goes up to 140. You say, what's going on here? It's like being in a microwave oven. You don't feel heat in the microwave oven. However, things start to cook internally, which is the reason why they say if you're in a 
uh, field, magnetic field, which just hangs there, what it's doing to your body, especially to the glands that control you, is deal with it as a magnet would with coins. It pulls them to a central place as far as it can get within the confines of your body. And that affects your brain, it affects your lungs, it affects your heart, it affects your circulation. If you're pregnant, it affects the baby that you're carrying. If you're old, it affects your memory. It causes Alzheimer's. In me, it dragged part of my inside intestines that normally should reside around my belly button down into my scrotum, which means that I have no control. Every time I walk near water, I have to pee. And if I don't pee, I'll pee in my pants. Can't get an erection. Unless, of course, I take their four-hour cure called Viagra, which I don't because it can cause blindness. That's what a magnetic field does. Think of having a sheet of paper and on top a whole bunch of coins. And all of a sudden you see the coins move. You say, well, they're moving on their own. And then you look under the sheet of paper and somebody's holding a magnet and moving it around from place to place. That's what happens to your body. Now, someone who wants to control the world would say, I need a secret way to kill people. Give or take the English language, that was the discussion that was had in a pre-Ice Age voodoo experiment and came out as I can hurt you from a distance and sticking a pin within a copy of a doll isn't going to hack it but sending electricity to the living stones under a person's house will And who has... I'm back. Yeah, he got cut off. Okay. I think, I don't know... Electricity on its own cannot do the type of job that needs to be done. It can charge the living stones under your house. But if you really want to do a good job, you have to distribute that charge throughout the house, not just centralize it in the middle of the basement. And electricity runs on fairly heavy wiring. That's not good for magnetism. Magnetism is what deals in very fine detail, like quartz in a watch 
or a starter switch on a car. General Motors think that they blew something, made a big mistake, and are paying billions of dollars for having a starter that shuts off while you're driving down the road. It has nothing to do with the starter. It was done exactly the way it should be done. But what it didn't know is when it would travel over a magnetic field, the magnetic field on the road would shut off the motor. Or if I was a trainer and I had a football in my hand and I went for a pee before the game started and I was holding the game ball and I went to a bathroom, uh, the um, air in the football would expand forcibly and go out the same hole it came in, minuscule amount, mind you. Most people wouldn't notice. So that when you leave the uh, field of magnetism, your, your ball would have less pressure in it than it had when you went to the bathroom. And I know some New England patriots would like to shove that down the commissioner's throat. It had nothing to do with somebody cheating except the hydro company that's there. But in a house, you have a network of very fine wires, and that's Bell. That's your telephone company. And it will bring the magnetic field all the way up the tallest skyscrapers in the world. And it can create a magnetic field in the walls of any room all depends on the construction. Some people know and others don't know. And those who know can build a house that is a perfect place for which to test out lifespans based on how much magnetism you get. This house is one of them. The process is called pickling or marinating. The word marin means semen in French. Marinating means you soften something up to make it more tender and ready to be eaten. That's what happens with Tom. Tom was being marinated by living in a room that had a predetermined magnetic field. He was marinated by a doctor's office whose assistant, the bureaucrat that answers the phone, would provide him with free pills. Anything she could get from the salesman free would end up in Tom's hand. Added to the pills he would get on official doctor's prescriptions, the cocktail would marinate him. And yet, when he went to the hospital and was lying on a hospital couch, kind of a table, he was, other than being underfed because he kept refusing to eat for two or three weeks leading up to the place where he fell down at Walmart on TV. They have a TV system that picks up everybody that comes in the store. Uh, he collapsed. 
immediately his doctor asked me uh, as his guardian whether or not I gave her permission to not resuscitate him. D-N-R, do not resuscitate. And I said, why are you asking me that? Look at him. Feed him. Give him an intravenous bottle. He's okay. He just signed his lottery ticket. But drip, drip, drip along the side past a little bottle in the middle between the intravenous material and the the arm was another little bottle there. And from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock, Tom was killed. The coroner who came from Ottawa and pronounced him dead saw a Tom which is totally un answerable under the normal circumstances of a body dying in a hospital. First thing they do is they close your eyes and shut your mouth. Second thing they do is make sure that you're ready to be examined and you don't have underwear. Third thing they do is your feet aren't going to get cold, so they take your socks off. Yet the body that I saw in the morgue the next morning had Tom's head leaning backwards and mouth wide open. The nurse said, I wonder why they left his underwear on as she lifted the blanket. Not, she's not a nurse. She's a, a um, manager of the hospital. And he had blue-gray colored socks, which he wore over a pair of thin socks. Yet the thin socks were gone, and the colored socks were back on. So the coroner was talking about a body whose mouth had been left open so that the mark of the beast, as they call it in the Bible, or the, the uh, sign put at birth uh, in, inside the mouth would be visible and matching up with the rose tattoo on his arm. Circumcision at birth is the way to keep permanently a set of that person's DNA. Thus, the reason for underwear saying this man had been circumcised. Or look at his feet. There's another message in the color of the socks. They gave us back the white socks he had underneath. That's how I know that they put the socks back on because they couldn't get the other ones off unless they took the top ones off first and put them back on. It was a process of marination that the cell has described as a cocktail. None of any of the activities by themselves could kill Tom. But put together from November to February on a person who had lived above 
in a magnetic field was all that was needed. Someone in the hospital has made this process available for those guardians who wish it to occur. Me, I was told, the minute he died, you, you lose your guardianship. I said, what the hell are you talking about? Who would want to be a guardian as long as nothing's going on, but when something happens, you're no longer the guardian? That doesn't make sense. But that's a lawyer who wrote up. So he's as guilty as whoever nurses aides or nurses or doctors in the hospital did. When I pointed all of these things out to the administrator of the hospital, the, uh, the woman in charge of all of the business activities and that stuff, she must have told the president. Without warning, he resigned. They're still looking for a replacement. But the guy who's doing the job now gave his credentials as having been trained by the Grey Nuns. They make the babies. They pay to have them raised. They kill them in the end. That's when they're dealing with an individual. But as with Noah's Ark, as with World War One, World War Two, the war in Korea, the war in uh, um, Saigon there, Vietnam, all are gene pool renovations. Each one of them. The French Revolution was a gene pool revol renovation. It was the bureaucrats working for the monarchs who said, we will take over. And the monarchs who were the genetically made gang from Latvia, they had their heads chopped off. But now, from 1789 to 2015, the bureaucrats have taken over. They're not called rats for nothing. They're the first line of exploration. They've taken over and they run the show. The politicians are cosmetic. Whether they be police officers, border guards, clerks at City Hall, people who answer the telephone, people who write the mail, they're all bureaucrats. And their turn has come. And that's why their boss, the nuns, ecclesiastic Freemasonry, the corporate empire of the world, Wall Street, London Stock Exchange, MI6, Military Intelligence 6, all of the women who have been genetically engineered to become women, women with a man's heart, 
women with man's lungs, women with a, uh, a shoulder uh, width that is like a middle linebacker, and even faint little ones will work behind the scene in any nunnery anywhere around the world. They're the ones who create sleeper cells and they've decided it's time for a genetic pool change. It's not outsiders they want to kill. Those they can deal with later. You should get this finished soon. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's their bosses that want to send a flood from the Great Lakes all the way down to the place the UN was created in 1945. Flushing Meadows, New York, and every place in between, they'll get the headquarters of the Ontario Provincial Police. They'll get all the border guards. They'll get all the police in Montreal, Toronto, Chicago, Detroit, all the way to New York and Queens. These Queens want to change human beings for flight into space. It requires that a woman become a hermaphrodite again. It requires only one breast because there's only going to be one child. It requires that urine be redirected uh, or out of the vagina and out with excrement just like chickens. Splurt, splurt. No, no need to have two systems. One will gather it all during the 34-year journey. It needs a lot of testing in breast implants of technology that will hear and report back everything it hears to the computer communications device on the spacecraft that brought them there, sending 7, 24-7, information on what they're doing every day for the rest of their lives. A breast is the perfect place to hide this material. And therefore, the Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute is taking all the breasts it can get from diseased women and then telling them that if they have one, they may get it in the other one, so you may as well give us the good one, too. It's all for genetic engineering purposes and for changing human beings into a single species. Acorns. Instead of corn, which was the name given to the Chinese, many kernels on one stalk, and A is shaped like a stepladder. On one side, you walk up and you reach over to the other side to get your tools, and on top, you have a communications device that communicates 24-7. Step ladder of the soccer world. Step ladder. A 
crook. But so what? That's the job of the UN. Millions of people will die. Millions of people from the head of the Great Lakes down to Flushing Meadow, New York. Nobody will be blamed. They'll say it's an act of God. <laughs> Don't forget, God is dog backwards. And a female dog is a bitch. Rin Tin Tin and Lassie. Did you ever see their husbands? No. Because I and Jennifer know this. Jennifer internally because of the pain and suffering they made her go through in her childhood her super ego has absorbed reality and she expresses it in dance and painting me chosen I'm told for my tenacity of having begun a journey in 1986 when I was asked for a bribe by a cabinet minister and going from 1986 to 2015 29 years living in poverty because I knew from the beginning that if I had a job as I had before, or had millions as I was about to have in my project, I could not find the truth. I had to do it from a different level of society. So I dropped down to the level of park bench and worked my way through for 29 years now. I was told by the cell 25 years of being on a project that involved poverty as a lifestyle for someone who was, in fact, raised in what you would call upper middle class. That was unbelievable to them and the reason why they said we've come to fill in the gaps and let you know how many times you've lived in the past and what is expected of you now and one of the things they reminded me a couple of things they reminded me was go back and read the book by uh, a Maronite priest called Khalil Gibran, the prophet, because they were the distributors of genetic engineers. Syria was the factory. Israel was where they created the 12 tribes. But the Maronites, Marionette, Maronites, Marinate, Virgin Mary, the Maronites are the distributors worldwide. Many, many orphanages are now open and operating in Africa because it's more difficult for the Western world to see what's going on. And the prime candidate is a twin. You make twins 
so that you can send one to one lifestyle and another to a separate lifestyle. And when they reach the age of 20 or 25, you can see the differences that social engineering came to a common genetic engineering done before birth. And the end product is what you choose to use. Is that what I'm looking for? A person who always says no? Then you've got to use this kind. Or a person who always says yes, you've got to use that kind. The personality of the genetically and socially engineered child comes from the amniotic fluid in which they were born. The preferred amniotic fluid known to mankind today in the world of genetic engineering is maple, the sap of a maple tree, which surrounds the Great Lakes and pours sugar into Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron. At Lake Erie, there are salt mines. Salt and sugar together make the best marinator. So down it falls over Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario, which is the bowl. And the overflow is the septic field. And that's what's going to your place. Not if you live on the island, but if you live on the mainland. and they died on TV. Watch the hockey games. Watch the baseball games. Watch the golf, tennis. They all have coded information. And in these upcoming World Series, it is the remote control of the Kansas City Royals taking on the stem cells of New York. Was making the finals going to prove to be the loser in the end if they, in fact, are hit by a flood? Did the Blue Jays win by coming in third, by not being there when the flood comes? That we will find out. But we do know it's going to happen sometime, and we do know that every year since 2011, they've been tweaking the weather tweaking the system of ice and uh, water, cold and hot, everything to make it more appropriate. I got to go. All right, Glenn. Bye okay. for now. We'll talk again. Okay. Jennifer, All right. needs, Jennifer uh, needs support. Yeah, Whatever when I get paid, uh, anyone can do. This yeah, is day he's 66. Okay. She's in jail. She's got to be here. She's got a job to do. She's been assigned the task of queen of cats. And I can't do that. I can barely keep them alive by myself. Uh, so she's got so what, to get what do you out of plan? jail. What do you need, Glenn? Bye for now. You can take international uh, checks. Yeah, international money orders from the post office is the easiest. 
Say right. your address again. Say your address. Post, post box seven seven four. Kemptville, Ontario, Canada. Postal code is KOG1JO. Zero. KOG, the O is always a zero. Okay. Bye for now. Okay. Bye. Bye.